Good evening, everyone. This is Shane Gebauer, the General Manager of Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. I'd like to welcome you all here this evening uh, for Candle Making 101. Just a, uh, a quick test of the, uh, the system here, just to make sure everyone can, uh, can hear me all right. Um, just uh, give me a quick post to, to let me know uh, that I'm coming through loud and clear. And all right, I got a couple people responding in, so I know the audio is working just fine. Thank you. Um, hopefully the, the recording is going to work okay. I just got a little uh, pop-up that I don't usually get, but we'll see at the end of this. Um, this evening, uh, obviously, Candle Making 101, we'll uh, touch on some of the basics. Um, a lot of times we find that people um, are sort of daunted by uh, where to begin with candle making. So we'll touch on... Um, some of uh, some of the basics and, and the principles that we uh, pick up will um, be applicable to some other types of candles, especially when we get to the tea lights and votives. So let's talk a little bit about making beeswax candles, and that's really what I'm going to focus on tonight. I'm not going to touch on paraffin or soy or uh, um, uh, some of the other wax types that are out there. Uh, we're just going to focus on beeswax, and we're going to cover a little bit of background information. Um, we're going to talk about some rolled candles. Uh, tea lights and and votives. Those are some of the easiest candles uh, to make and can certainly get you into the craft of uh, candle making. So let's talk a little bit about um, some background information. Um, wicking. What type of wick? What size of wick? There's a lot of different types out there. There's uh, zinc core, there's cotton core, there's paper core, there's all cotton all these different types of wicks and really um, I, there's we in our catalog we give some parameters in, in terms of what size wick to use but some factors that are going to affect your wicking selection will be the cleanliness of the wax. What happens is the wick as it's named wicks up the liquid wax into the fiber of that wick and, and brings it up to the, the flame through capillary action. If your wax is, um, has uh, an, exceptional, uh, an exceptional amount of particulate matter, propolis or things like that, what happens is as the wax melts, those little bits of, uh, of propolis or, or um, uh, pollen, or if it's, if it's really coarsely filtered, maybe some bee parts, but hopefully we've gotten those out of there. Um, but uh, those things get sort of drawn in toward the wick and sort of sucked into it. And that, of course, sort of plugs the filter, so to speak. It sort of plugs up that wick and, and inhibits the natural even flow of that melted wax up that wick to the flame. And so if you've got a lot, a lot of particulate, you're going to want a larger wick so that as it sort of begins to plug up, it's, that flame is still receiving enough uh, melted wax to combust and it doesn't get what we call under wick which is where the flame just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually may actually extinguish itself. The flip side of that is that um, you can over wick a candle. In other words you give it too large a wick it gets too much wax and it begins to get a little carbon head. It looks like a little mushroom on the top of that and may actually begin to produce a little bit of, of smoke. Um, and, and, and that's where you get sort of that black soot um, that may accumulate on uh, the inside of like a, a chandelier or some of your, your candle globes or something like that. So wicking is, is really sort of a science, and, and given that most of you, I suspect, will be sort of rendering your own wax, right? Uh, I presume most of us here on, on the, the call this evening are, are beekeepers, and so we've got our own wax. We want to incorporate that into candle making. Well, you might get some variation between batches of wax. Um, and so you might want to have a couple of different size wicks on hand and do a little experimentation. What we do occasionally with the wicking that we sell here at the business is we actually make up um, several different uh, several candles with different wicks to, to test to make sure that uh, we've got good wicking, uh, good wicking selection for you all to choose from. And of course, the size of the candle is going to play a role here too. If you've got a one-inch uh, candle, um, as opposed to maybe a three-inch pillar, uh, the wick for that one-inch candle is going to be a little bit smaller, quite a bit smaller, 
than uh, it would be for the uh, three-inch pillar because that uh, you you're for that three-inch pillar, you're going to want a little bit larger flame to help melt that uh, that larger diameter of wax. The other thing to keep in mind, and this will be important when we get uh, to, to the tea lights and votives later on, is the melting point of beeswax is about 145 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take a couple hundred degrees, it varies a bit, but it's right in there at about 145. The melting point of paraffin ranges from about 120 to 150. Now there are these, uh, the reason why there's a, a 30 degree range there is that there's a lot of different variations on paraffin and, and there are some that uh, melt a little bit lower than 120 and some that melt a little bit higher than 150, but that's a, that's a pretty good range. Note that the paraffin is, is for the most part below the melting point of beeswax. And when it comes to uh, actually wicking our tea lights and votives later on in the conversation this evening, that will be important. Um, so that's just sort of a little bit of background on, on sort of wicking selection um, and a bit about, uh, about the waxes. So let's get in now to the rolled candle sheets. Now this is a, this is a beeswax candle sheet that's been dyed green. And the candles that uh, I'm going to illustrate this evening are what we call pencil top candles. Uh, they've got a little bit of taper to the top, and you'll see the final product here at the end. So we're going to start with a full sheet of um, of found of of a full sheet of beeswax here, and notice this. Um, let me get my marker out here. Notice uh, this little cardboard uh, template that we've created here. Um, we're going to use that as as a guide. Uh, also, what we're doing here is is laying out our wick. What we're going to do here is uh, we're going to cut this, this sheet in half. That will give us a pair of candles. And this right here, uh, this extra loop of wick is the amount of wick that will connect our two pairs. So if you want your pairs to really dangle with a lot of wick between them, you would just make this loop uh, a little bit bigger. If you don't want much wick between them, you want a nice tight pair, then shorten this loop up a bit. Um, but that's how you get your, your surplus um, for uh, the hanging pair. And the wick that we're using here uh, is, is 2 slash O wicking, which is, is pretty good wicking for um, the beeswax sheets. So first off, let's talk a bit about this cardboard template. How did, uh, how did I make that up? Um, basically, the important thing is that you've got a square edge here that you're going to line up with the square edge of the sheet here. And you've got a square edge, a straight edge here, and this is this angle right here is you know a 90 degree angle, so that's you want to make sure of that. Um, and what I've done is, whoops, uh oh, having some technical difficulties here. Go on. Um, what I've done with this is um, uh, measured out. Where's my, there we go, there we go. I've measured out uh, basically eight and three quarter inches from to the center point of the, so, of the cardboard. So you want to measure the distance here, divide it by two, and you want that to be about eight and, and three eighths uh, inches. These sheets vary a little bit sometimes when they're cut. So you want to do, you, what this, this measurement is right here, this eight and three eighths, you want to measure the total width of um, this wax sheet and divide it by two. In this case, it was eight and three eighths. So you want to divide this. Uh, this sheet was uh, what's that? Doubled. It's uh, sixteen and three quarter. Um, so you want to um, uh, basically get to the center point of the sheet of, of beeswax, and then to get that angle. Um, boy, this isn't behaving well. There we go. To get that angle, uh, what I did is I I marked a a square line on this cardboard. Let me pull pull that out. So this angle right here, before I, I made this cut here with my knife, was 90 degrees going through that center point there. And then I measured up an inch here, and then this space right here is also an inch. And then I just sort of connected the dots with a, you can just make out a little bit of, sh of my straight edge right there. Uh, and I just connected my dots and used a utility knife to make a nice straight line there, and that's how I made my cardboard template. Now, if we didn't, um, if we just wanted uh, to to create sort of a flat-topped candle, 
All we'd have to do is cut this sheet in half with a nice square line going through. But this, this angle right here will create that pencil top. Also, you can make uh, uh, pillars. And all we would do there is instead of um, uh, cutting the sheet at all, we'd lay our wick along this edge and, and roll this entire sheet up uh, using the entire width. And we'd end up with a, with a pillar candle. That's, uh, they usually work out to be close to about an inch and a half uh, or so in diameter, maybe maybe two inches in diameter, um, and so that's how we create our template, um, and that's that's how uh, uh, we're going to proceed. So now I, I I square up the template here with and the edge down here, um, and I just make simply follow this cardboard. Try not to uh, to cut your cardboard with the uh, utility knife because you want to keep that edge nice and straight because this is this angle is going to form our our taper. All right, so um, now what we do is we take that wick and we lay it along this edge. And here, so here's our cut right here. We've sort of separated the sheets apart a little bit. Um, and the wick's being laid along that edge. And then it's just being folded over. Uh, that, that edging uh, is just being sort of folded over that wick to pinch it. And you want to pinch it good and tight. Uh, so that it holds. And you'll also notice here how straight and tight it is. Uh, you want to make sure that it's right along that edge. You don't want a big loop like this because that will affect how the candle burns. So the straighter the wick in there, uh, the better off you'll be. And then what we're going to do is just slowly begin to roll this. And it takes a little bit to get uh, to sort of get it started. And it might not be the prettiest thing uh, when you first start out. But eventually what you want is notice how, how straight this is right here. And also notice um, uh, our hand model here uh, with her, her, her nice fingers. Uh, this happens to be the hands of, of my wife. Um, notice how she's got her fingers sort of spread out across the width uh, of, this, of this candle here. She's not simply just sort of, you know, a lot of times the tendency is just sort of to to sort of roll a little bit here and then and then jump over here and roll this end and then and then come back over here and roll this end. You know, she's rolling the entire width at the same time. And the reason for that is that you'll end up with the bottom, this edge right here being nice and square, nice and even. If you if you do it from the center, what happens is, you know, maybe maybe this this end gets a little bit ahead of this end, and so you end up with a, a, a bottom, the bottom of the candle ends up looking a little funky. So you want to make sure you roll it nice and even. The other thing to keep in mind is before you actually roll any of these candles, you want your wax sheets to, uh, to be on the warmer side. Uh, now you don't have to like put them in the oven or anything, you'll melt them that way, but you want to keep them, you know, about 75, maybe 80 degrees. Uh, in this case, we've got forced hot air that comes up underneath the counter. So if we leave the sheets on top of the counter, they sort of get pre-warmed, if you will. People take um, uh, heating pads that maybe you'd put under your or behind your back. You can lay a piece of cardboard on top of it and then roll your candles on top of that cardboard. And that sort of helps a little bit, too. Wax gets very, very brittle when it's cold. And so you don't want to try and roll candles when, they're, when the sheets are cold because you'll end up with a disaster. They'll crack on you. They'll break on you. You won't have a very pleasant experience. So right around you know, room temperature or a little bit warmer uh, would be fine. Okay. Now here's, here's our final uh, product of one of the pair. And notice all this surplus wick sort of hanging out the, uh, the top here. Um, that's the wick that's going to be used for uh, the second half of our candle sheet. And also notice this right here. This is the bottom of the candle. And again, notice how flat it is across the bottom. And that's important. You want a nice looking base to this candle. And, and the reason why it's nice and flat, again, is because it was rolled nice and evenly. One end of the candle didn't get ahead of the other. Now, if by chance, um, as you're rolling this right here, if let's say this end does begin to get uh, a little bit ahead, and you do begin to see that the base isn't even, you can certainly unroll it a bit and sort of try and square it back up. But you don't want to be going back and forth, rolling this up, unrolling it, rolling it up, unrolling it, because you'll begin to fatigue the, the wax sheet a bit, and it'll affect your final product. Okay? So you want to, again, nice and even. 
And then now you can see how that angle also creates this sort of tapered look uh, to the top of the candle. It's very nice. Um, <clears throat> and to roll your pair, now you take your surplus wick, you lay it across the sheet just like you did before, and roll it up. And you can see how, how they're attached right here. And now here's the little loop that we had at the beginning, and there's, there's our hanging pair. Um, and that's, that's essentially uh, all there is to rolled candles. You can do a lot of variations with this. Again, you can, um, instead of cutting this angle like this, you can cut it square across, and then that would create a flat topped uh, up here, just like the bottom is flat. So you can do that sort of candle. You can do a pillar, like I mentioned. Roll this whole sheet all the way across without cutting it at all, and you'd end up with a nice, a nice pillar. You can get creative and start doing uh, two-colored uh, sheets and creating sort of these two-colored candles. There's a lot of variations you can do. Um, but that's the basics on, on candle making, or on, on rolled candles. Uh, just a side note, um, uh, you can easily sell these if you're interested in, in sort of putting some candles in, uh, in, in a farmer's market or maybe some local stores. You could probably sell these fairly easily for $3.95, $4.95 a pair, and the wax sheets are, they retail for about uh, $1.45 or something. So that would be a pretty good margin. Um, or they also make very nice gifts. Um, now, moving on. Now we're getting into melted wax. Um, first, we'll talk about the tea lights. Here is uh, here's my, my chunk of wax. You can see it's, it's fairly clean. It does have a little bit of particulate in there, but not too bad. It's, it's pretty good and clean. I'm not going to enter these candles into a show or anything. Um, if you've got a big chunk of wax and you want to break it up so it fits inside your pour pot, the easiest way to do that is throw it in the freezer for uh, overnight and, um, and then the next day put it in a box and take a hammer. And, and again, beeswax gets uh, fairly brittle, uh, very brittle when it's cold, and it's fairly easily, easily cracked when uh, hit with a hammer after being in a freezer all night. You can see actually I used a little bit of a, a chisel. Um, actually, it was a hive tool that I smacked with a hammer to get this, uh, this block to, to break apart. And then now, here's, here's my double boiler that I've got. Just a, a cheap, uh, inexpensive stock pot that uh, I picked up uh, as a three-pot set from, uh, from Kmart. My pour pot inside, and of course, there's water down inside here, and just pure wax uh, inside my pour pot. Um, you don't want to put any sort of cover on top of this because as the water begins to heat uh, and, the, and begins to steam a little bit, if you had a cover on, the steam would hit that cover, condense, and could possibly then drip down into your, um, into your pour pot and you'd end up with water in your, your wax. And that would create sort of a sparking candle uh, and not necessarily those, those trick candles that relight. It's not a very pleasant spark. Um, the other thing that you want to be careful of, too, is that uh, the water level isn't too high because if that water does begin to boil, you don't want uh, the bubbles as they break, uh, the boiling uh, water bubbles, to sort of spit water droplets inside, inside your pour pot and give you uh, water in your wax. So you want to be careful of, of those things. And on, uh, this is just, by the way, on uh, sitting on a, a little tabletop type uh, burner that, that I also picked up at Kmart for forty dollars or something like that. And that way I don't uh, I don't um, get my kitchen stove all dirty. And and it's electric. You want to make sure you're using um, you want to make sure you're using electric uh, heat sources, not gas, uh, so that you uh, reduce the risk of fire. Okay. Let's get uh, let's get everything ready while our while our wax is melting. This is uh, out in my garage in uh, in my wood shop. Uh, I've got uh, my little tea light cups laid out. Uh, I'm going to be doing votive, so I've got my votive mold uh, laid out here, and I also have my wickings, all my wick already. Now I'm using pre-assembled wicks here. Um, frankly, they're so much easier. You can buy these little tabs right here. You can buy a wick and and make your own, um, but really, folks, it's so much easier just to buy these wicks. The only thing you need to be careful of 
is just try and get your wick fairly straight. Um, and especially when, you, when we talk about the votive wicks, which tend to be a little bit longer, um, those votive wicks can really sort of have uh, a lot of bending to them. And you want to make sure it's fairly straight so that it sits straight inside your, your candle when you insert that wick, or uh, insert that wick rather. Okay, so I'm all set. You want to make sure you have all your supplies laid out because when your wax begins to cool, you've got a very narrow window of opportunity to get that uh, wick in. So here I am. Uh, I'm pouring my, uh, my first um, uh, uh, tea light. Uh, let me just back up for a second here. Notice, too, that this is the edge of my table. Okay, it's it's easy to sort of lay out a bunch of tea lights here and, and just go right down the line and pour them. But it's also uh, uh, a, a bit dangerous because as you're pouring, if you get a drip or two that runs down uh, your pour pot, it could make a mess. Um, also, it's sort of some, sometimes because your pour pot's so full, um, you've got to sort of have it at an angle and you can sort of have it over the edge of the table, other, and that way you can get right down. Notice how close I am to my, my cup here, my tea light cup. Uh, I'm not pouring from several inches up, and if I have a pot that's half full of wax, you know, I can't get down this low, but I can, if here's the edge of my table right here, I can sort of hang my pot off the edge and get right down next to the tea light. And that also brings up another uh, a good point. You don't want your pour pot uh, much above uh, halfway. In fact, this one, when I had everything melted, was maybe about a third, maybe a quarter to a third of the way full. And again, that allows me to get right down uh, close. Think of this: you know, when you get when you open up your first, when you open up your gallon of milk, you know, for that first pour, and you're trying to get it in your glass, and the level of, of milk is right up near to the the top of the cap. You know, and you usually end up dribbling a little down and probably spilling a bit because you got to do it kind of fast so it gets in your glass. It's the same thing with your wax and your tea light cup. Here's your here's your glass and, and here's the carton of milk. The closer you can get to the, the cup, the better off you're going to be. All right, enough about that. Here is uh, my, my tea light uh, full. Uh, in this case, we do a single pour. We fill it right up to the top. Here, don't panic. If uh, this takes a little bit of practice, and I'll admit I got fairly lucky when I did these um, for the photos, I didn't spill a one. Um, but if you look carefully at my table, you see plenty of wax droplets. Uh, you want to get it fairly close to the top without overflowing. If you do overflow it, don't worry because what will happen is as this wax cools, the next day you can actually pop out your tea light uh, out of this cup if you wanted to. And you can just put it into a new clean cup, and you've got a perfectly fine uh, tea light. But you wouldn't necessarily want to burn a, a tea light that had a, a dribble of wax coming down the outside of your, your tea light cup, because what will happen is this wax on the outside will also melt, and it will just make a bit of a mess in whatever container you're using, uh, if you're using a container at all. Okay, so there's my first, my first one. Um, here are uh, a couple, a couple more, um, and I want to point out sort of the condition of these as I go from left to right. Notice how this one. Well, let's start with the right one. You can see the circle right here where the base of that that tea, that uh, uh, wicking tab is going to sit. You can also see the little dimples of uh, of the base of the tea light cup. This one is not quite ready to, uh, to have the wick put in. And the reason why we put the wicks in after the wax is poured and uh, as it's cooling is because these particular wicks and most wicks that you get like this that are sort of these pre-assembled ones are coated with actually, they're actually coated with paraffin. These are all cotton wicks with a slight, a very small coating of paraffin so they stand straight and it give them, gives them a little rigidity. Okay? Now, if you were using zinc core, you wouldn't necessarily have to coat them with paraffin because the zinc core would help keep it straight, but there's a lot of concern about the burning zinc nowadays. So the, the small coating of paraffin helps keep the wick straight, but remember right at the onset we talked about how 
the melting point of paraffin is generally lower than beeswax. So we want our beeswax to begin to cool before we insert these wicks. And that's what we're seeing here. This one's a little, this one's the hottest of these three, this one's the middle, and this one, this one is just right. It's like the bears and the porridge. This one's just right. You can see how it's got sort of a film almost on the bottom. And what's going to happen is when we take our tea light wick and insert it, you basically get one shot at this. Because what's going to happen is there's a thin layer of almost solidified wax at the bottom of that tea light cup. And it's sort of like a gooey, sticky, it's almost like rubber cement. And when that tea light, uh, when that wick tab hits that layer of wax, it sticks. So as you, as you lower the wick down in, you want to make sure you try and position it right into this little uh, depression of that tea light cup. Um, and, and get it centered. And the last thing you want to do is try and, you know, posi reposition this wick because what we, we, we sort of say you're overworking the wick and what will happen is it will begin to get a little soft and it'll begin to slump over and it won't be centered and it won't stand up straight. So you want to just be real careful when you let, lower it down in there because generally speaking I found that once it sticks you're better off just leaving it because when you try and move it you know, it sort of goes flying across the tea light cup and ends up way over against the edge because, you know, you know, you're trying to move it, trying to move it. All of a sudden, that gooeyness lets loose and, and the wick slides to the edge on you. Um, so just be careful as you're lowering it down and just try and get it right into that center. And so now you can see I'm sort of solidifying here um, with the wicks, with the wicks in, in position, okay? And now here it is the next day. You can see how easily I've just pulled this out. So now in this case, I didn't dribble any wax down the edge. But if I had, I can just pull this out, pop it into a, uh, a new cup, and I'm all set. If you start to get a bunch of these cups that have a little bit of dribble going down the side, you can use these essentially as molds then um, and just pop them out and, and transfer them into new cups if you'd like. So that way you don't, uh, you don't have to waste them. Okay, but there's our, our completed tea light. Let's move on now to votives. Here is uh, a motive mold, and this mold's been used uh, a couple of times. You can see actually a little bit of residual wax in that mold. And so what I'm doing here is I just have a paper towel with a little bit of wax remover, and I'm just going to go down, this, down all six of these and just sort of wipe out that extra wax. Um, that little bit of wax, what will happen is uh, that wax is, is sort of bonded to the, the metal cup, the mold, and when I pour in my new wax, it bonds to this layer. And it makes removing these votives a little bit challenging. So the cleaner you have your cups, the better off you'll, or your, your mold rather, the better off you'll be. So I usually clean them, you know, after... Uh, a couple of pours or when I see that they're sort of getting dirty. So I just take this paper towel that's got some wax remover and just run down them and get them good and clean. Okay, And then uh, to aid in the release of uh, the, uh, the votives, I just shoot a little bit of um, uh, spray in here, um, a little silicone mold uh, release so that um, they pop out uh, a little bit easier once they've actually hardened off. Again, we want to make sure uh, our wick is as straight as possible. You'll never get it perfectly straight, but you can do this uh, while your wax is melting, and you want to make sure that you, can, you have them laid out and ready to go, because again, once your wax begins to cool, you've got a, a small window of opportunity. And that's an, you know, this, another reason, uh, jumping back to the tea lights a little bit, that you don't want to lay out a whole bunch of, of cups because uh, if you it doesn't take long to pour them. So if you've got numerous cups laid out and you've gone down, you poured, 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 now all of a sudden they're starting to cool. Well, you've got to, to quickly get all those wicks in there and chances are between the first wick you've installed and the very last cup, that last cup may actually have hardened off a bit uh, too much to install the wick. So, you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. But make sure you've got all your wicks ready to go and you've got your mold all cleaned and prepped 
And again, notice how it's sort of near the edge of the table so I can sort of hang the bottom of my, uh, my pour pot off. Okay, um, and here we are pouring. Uh, oh, what you can just make out here, right here, is a paper towel. Um, one of the things you want to be careful of is when you pull your pour pot out of your uh, water bath, of course there's going to be water on that pour pot. And so I always sort of pick it up. I make sure that I don't, I don't um, carry it over top of my uh, votive mold or the tea light cups or whatever it is I'm pouring into in, because I don't want a drop of water to fall off the outside of my pot into a mold. Into a mold. So I always sort of make sure I go over, you know, a portion of the bench that I don't have any supplies that I'm going to be using. And I take this paper towel and I sort of wipe down uh, the water. And then also it sort of serves as a little catch uh, rag. Should a drop of wax sort of run down here, it hits the, uh, the, um, the paper towel rather than running into my hand and, and risk of, of burning me. So uh, I pour this. Notice that I'm not right up to the very top. With, with votives, we're going to do a two-pour uh, process here. The reason for that is that we've got, um, we've got more wax with these votive uh, molds than we did with the tea lights. And what happens is as that wax cools, as that wax cools, it begins to sort of shrink. And as it shrinks, you can actually get a little depression that sort of forms in the center. And that that's you know doesn't really affect the burning of the candle too much, but it's not very pleasant to look at. It's not a very aesthetically pleasing candle. And so what we're going to do is once this sort of skims over, uh, we're going to come back and sort of top it off, but not once this. We we want to do it though before this candle is completely hardened, because what will happen is if this wax is still warm but has a little bit of a, a layer to the top of it when we when we top it off again, those two layers will fuse together, so you won't have a line when you uh, that's created between those two layers when you pop the candle out. Okay, so um, uh, you want to uh, to go down here, uh, fill up your molds, but leave a little bit of uh, leave a little bit of uh, um, uh, uh, head space at the top. Here you can see. Uh, you can see a that skim beginning. This is right about when we want to add our wicks. Notice that we've got a little bit of uh, hardening of the wax around the uh, around the rim, around the edge, and also you can make out right in here sort of this this film that's beginning to form on the top of this candle. This is what you want to look for. This is just about perfect for installing your wick. Again, we don't want to put the wick in too soon because that paraffin will get too soft and it'll sort of slump. And with this film, what will happen is this film will sort of help anchor the wick into the, in the center of the candle. And we don't want to overwork it again because as you sort of try and center your wick, if you move it back and forth, back and forth, you know, it's sort of like taking a, a, you know, a, a piece of metal or something and bending it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Eventually it weakens and it'll sort of break. Well, as you move your wick back and forth, back and forth, that layer of paraffin sort of weakens and it doesn't hold itself upright quite as well as perhaps it should. So you want to wait for this film to form uh, and that'll hold that, uh, that wick just about perfect. And here we go. We've got, uh, we've got the wick in now. Uh, you've got a couple of bubbles. I've got a couple of bubbles. I'm not too terribly worried about these right now because I'm going to put another layer of wax on top of this and that oh, these bubbles are going to get masked over. They, you won't be able to see them. Um, so I'm not too worried about that. And um, now what I've done is uh, I've gone down my line. Notice this wick is, is off center. You know, I probably want that one right about here, but I'm not I'm not going right now and moving it. Um, I want to want this film to develop a little bit more. You can see here, now I've centered it up and, and you can see too, you know, you sort of see a wrinkle right here from where I broke that film to get it centered. Again, I'm not too worried about that because I'm going to top these off with a layer of, a, a fresh layer of wax that will completely cover this up. You will never ever see this. Um, but you can also see this sort of darker color here indicating that my wax is still hot underneath. 
I don't want this, uh, I don't want to wait until the next day to top these candles off because then those two layers of wax will not fuse together uh, and I will end up with a line or even worse when I pop these out of the mold those two layers will separate and I'll end up with sort of this disc that's you know just a, a, a little, just the thickness of a wick that's sort of sitting on top of this portion of the candle and that, that's not very nice at all. Um, so I, I want to pour while that wax is still soft. So now here I am topping this candle off. I'm, I'm topping this first one off. There's my bubble. And you can see actually how it's melted right through uh, down to that bottom layer. Um, and so you can see how that these two layers are going to fuse, but I still have enough of this sort of uh, hardened off layer that, that was from my original pour that's holding my wick in place. And you can see that over here as well. So I'm going to go down the line. I probably could have put a little more wax um, on the top of this one. That one's not quite as full as, uh, as I might have liked. Um, um, that I always keep the rejects for myself and give the nicer ones away. Um, so that one will end up on our, our, uh, our table. Um, but to go down the line and top and top these off, and, and here's what they look like as they're topped off. So now you can see that there's no wrinkle here like there was. You can see how these uh, layers are sort of fusing together. You can see how uh, they're melting together. Now here, note right here, I do have a little bit of a bubble. That one now, that's in my second pour. I, I did actually pop that bubble before that wax hardened off. Um, and so that uh, it wouldn't show up, okay? And <clears throat> finally, here's the, uh, the finished product popped out. You cannot see that line that, uh, uh, from the two pores. Uh, this is a fairly well-shapen uh, candle with the wick in the center. Very nice. Now, here are some other considerations to keep in mind before you actually pour anything. Um, you want to make sure that uh, you're doing this at a, in a temperature setting that's not too cold. Again, room temperature, you don't want a lot of drafts because that will affect sort of how the wax hardens off. If your molds are too cold or your air temperature is too cold, it may actually chill that wax prematurely and you might end up with cracking. Uh, you don't want your wax to chill quickly. If you're in a rush and you're using this votive mold up here, so if you're using this votive mold and you only have one, but you want to make you know a bunch of votives, the the natural tendency is to wait for wait for these to sort of harden off on the top and then throw it in the freezer to, to quickly harden it off. That will be a big mistake. You'll end up with cracks going across the top. You'll end up with big uh, sort of um, uh, depressions in the center because the wax was chilled too quickly. Uh, you won't end up with a very nice product. So you want to do this at, uh, in, a, in, a, in a reasonably warm room, room temperature. You don't want a lot of drafts, um, and you don't want to rush the curing of these, uh, of these uh, votives or any type of candle that you're making. The other thing that you can do with this one, again, I sprayed these. This one popped right out. Notice how I'm sort of squeezing the mold a little bit. That just sort of breaks it loose, and you can lift it right up. If you do have a problem getting these candles out, once it's hardened off, once it's the next day, at that point, you can throw it uh, into the freezer, and that wax will shrink away from the metal uh, and make it easier to, uh, to pop out. But you don't want to do that before it's uh, hardened off completely. Um, that's all I've got uh, for um, rolled candles, tea lights, and, uh, and votives. So let me, uh, I see that uh, there's been some people uh, posting questions, so let me uh, uh, get over here to my question panel and, uh, and see what we've got. Just give me one second here to pull that up. And all right. Oh, let me, uh, I'm sorry, just a little slow here. There we go. Uh, let me get up to the top. Um, uh, so, um, person looking for uh, a source of um, interesting molds, preferably the silicone ones, you know, the best selection of molds that I've ever seen actually come out of Germany. 
um, we're going to be incorporating some of those molds into our 2010 ca uh, catalog. We don't have them just yet, but um, the, most of um, the really good, interesting molds that I've seen, really ornate ones, um, very unusual ones, uh, come out of Germany. So, um, Alan, probably the, it would be expensive shipping, but it, that's where you're going to find your best source of, of uh, silicone candle molds. Germany, for some reason, they're just avid candle makers, and um, and they've got a, all the companies over there have a fa fantastic uh, selection. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, all right. Uh, just people responding right at the very onset that they were hearing me. Um, so uh, wax shrinking away from Wiccan Center. Third concern, minimum cooling time prior to remove to removing mold. So the, the I assume when you say the, the wax shrinking away from the wick in the center, you're sort of getting that hollow, that depression around the wick. Um, a lot of times you'll uh, you'll have to do that uh, that second pour once it begins to sort of cave in. And in some cases, you may even have to do a, a third pour depending on depending on the uh, the size of the mold and how much wax it's holding. Of course, the larger uh, the the larger the volume, the more potential for shrinkage at that point, um, or the more amplified it may be, uh, depending also on the opening where you're pouring the wax in. So um, that's going to affect how that uh, wax shrinks away from the wick in the center, sort of forms that cavity. So try that second pour, maybe a third pour. Um, and in terms of minimum cooling time prior to removing, removing from the mold, again, that depends a little bit on, on the mold. A tea light, you know, if I wanted to pop those out, probably within a few hours it would be hardened off sufficiently. But a votive, of course, is going to be a little bit longer. If you've got something that's got a, a you know, a pint or, or even, well, a quartz, I guess, a bit excessive. But if a pint of wax in it, which there are molds that take that much, uh, obviously, the cure time on that's going to be the hardening time on that's going to be much much longer. I don't know of any sort of um, uh, equation, so to speak, that say if you've got X volume of wax uh, at Y room temperature, uh, it's going to take so many uh, at minutes per ounce of liquid wax or something like that. Um, uh, I'm not aware of that, but those are factors that are going to go into that. Of course, room temperature the volume of uh, the wax in there, um, and the starting point of uh, the mold. Um, uh, let's see, uh, why isn't the cardboard right at the edge of the wax sheet? Um, I, uh, I think that was in, a previous, in an early slide before I moved it there. I just sort of had it in the center just to sort of show um, it in relation to the, uh, the sheet. Um, uh, you know, Here's a question about the rolled candles and, and if they burn faster than, than poured candles. And they do burn a little bit faster. But, Jeff, I was the, the first time I, I, uh, I rolled some, actually, I should say, the first time my wife rolled some candles and, uh, and we burned them, um, I was really surprised at how long they lasted. They can last, you would think they'd be gone in a half an hour. But they actually last uh, a, a couple of hours. And the reason for that is, that as the wax melts, it sort of falls down into the layers uh, uh, from the rolling process and sort of gets caught in the, uh, in the embossed cells. And so essentially what happens is you end up forming a solid layer of wax and it burns very similar to a, um, to a uh, say, a regular taper that we have here in, in the picture um, that I've got up right now. Now, it, it, I say that, that it burns very similar, but the fact of the matter is that there is a whole lot more wax in this candle than there is in a rolled candle, so of course this one will burn longer. But they burn longer than you might expect. It's really quite nice. Uh, are the wicks that we sell uh, lined with wire? Um, they, uh, we do uh, have a zinc core wick, but we also have a, uh, a cotton wick. The pre-assembled wicks that I, uh, that I was using here for the tea lights and votives do not have a wire in them. It's a solid cotton uh, wick uh, with, again, it does have that little layer of, of paraffin, but it's a solid cotton wick. Uh, which size wicks do you use for the tea lights and votives? 
Oh gosh, Carol. Um, uh, it's it's there's three numbers in it, and I can't remember what they are. I can I can look it up for you. I don't remember off the top of my head what size it is. It's it it it's a little bit different naming convention than say like a two slash o or a one slash o or or zero slash two. Um, there's three numbers that sort of go into dictating the uh, the size of that wick, and I can't recall off the top of my head what size they are. Um, uh, but I can look into that for you. Uh, how long does it take to cool where I can put in the wick for the votive? Um, again, it depends a little bit on room temperature, the temperature of your wax. You probably want your wax, by the way, I failed to mention that. You probably want it up at about 160 degrees, uh, which is just a little, you know, only about, what's that, 15 degrees above um, above the, uh, the melting point thereabouts. So you don't want it too terribly hot. And it's not a bad idea to put a thermometer in it just to, to monitor the temperature. But, uh, Robert, it's, it's good. for those votives, it took maybe five, ten minutes. For the tea lights, probably closer to five minutes before it started to skim over and I was ready to, um, to uh, insert the wick. Uh, what is beeswax to paraffin wax ratio? I assume this is if you want to blend them. Uh, the blending would depend a lot on, on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure, Mark, what, uh, what you mean by that. Um, but you can add them at any ratio you want. You could do 90% beeswax to 10% paraffin if you want to mix it, or 50-50. Um, can you add essential uh, oils to beeswax for scenting? Absolutely. Uh, in this case, we're using natural beeswax. It hasn't been uh, ultra-refined, so it does have that natural beeswax odor. So you need to keep that in mind um, when you're adding your scents, that you're going to have to sort of overwhelm that natural beeswax odor or complement it. Um, so you don't want sort of conflicting odors that uh, clash, if you will. Um, you want them to complement one another. And you, wanna, uh, you don't want to, to, to add those essential oils uh, to the wax when it's very hot. Um, so again, you want to keep your wax cooler so that um, you don't sort of evaporate off, volatize the, uh, the odor of those essential oils. You want it to linger on. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, another question about how long it takes for the votive to sort of harden off. I've always let them just sit overnight. Um, uh, just so that I know they're good and hard, um, usually because I get distracted by other things. But it takes several hours at least for it to completely harden off. Um, and if, if you tr what happens, if you try and pop them out too early, the wax down deep uh, can still be sort of um, a little bit soft and, and gummy. And so when you try and pop it out of the mold, it can sort of stick a little bit more than it might otherwise. Uh, and so if you rush it, uh, you may run into problems. But I would give it a, uh, well, I'm not, I'd be afraid to say six hours, but I suspect that that would probably be sufficient. But you're just better off pouring them at night, letting them sit overnight, and then first thing in the morning you can pop them out. Other candles, again, it depends a little bit on the type of candle and how much wax you've got. If you're doing tapers, uh, usually uh, about six hours is sufficient, so it's good and hard. And you want to make sure, again, that it's cooled completely, and then it sort of shrinks away from the mold uh, as well, and that's, that's useful. Um, how long will a votive burn? It burns, uh, a votive burns uh, a little bit, there, again, not to be vague and ambiguous about these answers, but it's, it's, some, it, it, they're, it's the nature of it, uh, frankly. But they, they burn uh, depending on whether you've got drafts, they'll burn faster. Uh, if you've got it in a, uh, what type of votive cup or, a, 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 yeah, votive cup you've got it in, what kind of container you've got it in. If it's one where uh, it's like those square glass ones that the wax, uh, if it spills, if it sort of erodes off the side and sort of drains out of the top of the candle, it'll burn more quickly. If, if it's a tighter container where the wax sort of pools at the top, and so it, it, it doesn't run away from the wick, but rather burns through the wick, it'll last much longer. But the votive mold that we sell, we call it a 15-hour votive mold, and they can last they can last that long under ideal conditions. But uh, generally speaking, probably not, but you can easily get 10 hours out of it. 
Um, comment, we've used the silicone muffin pans that are, that are snowflakes and Christmas tree designs. They make nice molds too. That's a great idea. You know what you can do? I, I'm not exactly sure what these look like or how big they are, but you can make Christmas ornaments out of them if you want. You can actually take a little piece of wicking or a little piece of uh, ornament tinsel, and as it cools, uh, sort of insert it to create a little loop, and that way you can, you can hang it up if you wanted. Uh, we've done that in the past. Is there, a, uh, is there a way to make beeswax sheets with your own wax? Um, uh, there, there is, um, it depends on whether you want that embossed pattern or just a plain sheet, but, uh, the easiest way to make your own sheets is to take a, uh, a piece of wood that's about the size of the sheet of wax that you want to make, you soak it in water, uh, and then you melt your wax and you dip that board in your melted wax. And what happens is you uh, form a, a layer of wax on that board, but it doesn't stick to the board because of the water. And then you take a knife and sort of trim it off and you end up with a sheet. Uh, of course, that doesn't have an embossed pattern to it. If you want the embossed pattern, then you've got to either get uh, embossing mills or a, uh, a mold that actually forms that, that pattern. So you can, but it's, it's a complicated process. Uh, will any wick work for beeswax or is one type better than another? There are different wicks for different types of wax. The wicks that we carry really are designed for beeswax since you know, we're dealing mostly with beekeepers that are using their own. But um, you, you would want to use different, wa different, different wicks rather for different types of wax. Uh, you could certainly do it. Uh, you could use the same wicks, but they're going to, if, if you made a, uh, let's say this candle right here, if you made this candle, this taper candle out of beeswax using a, uh, a 2 slash O wick, and you made the same candle out of paraffin using a 2 slash O wick, it's going to burn, those two candles will burn very differently. So you'd want to do some, do some testing there. Um, what is wax remover? It smells a lot like citrus. It's almost like, uh, you know, sort of like citrusol sort of stuff. I'm not quite sure if it is, but it's sort of, it, it's along those lines. Um, uh, uh, is it necessary to use a double boiler rather than heating directly? I would definitely use a double boiler rather than heating di directly. Um, you never really want to heat wax directly on a burner. Always use double boiler because after all it is in fact flammable um, and that water bath protects it from direct heat and, uh, and reduces any chance of, of uh, accidental combustion. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so is there, um, is there any recommendation for using the antique taper mold? Um, sort of the ones that uh, that they used to use in the olden days that uh, there's six or so on in, uh, in the mold. Um, to get them clean, you want to use a little wax remover. You can take, uh, you can take some cotton balls or, or better yet, a piece of fabric uh, and wind it up around something and almost like uh, you'd be cleaning uh, the inside of a, a barrel. Um, you can sort of swab it out the inside uh, using some fabric. Cotton balls you can use, but sometimes they leave little fibers behind that get into your candles, whereas um, with fabric, uh, you're more apt to get it a little cleaner. But you can sort of scrub out the inside, so to speak, with uh, some candle remover, uh, wax remover, rather soaked uh, uh, fabric to clean them out. Um, you want to make sure that the opening at the bottom does not get uh, too big so that wax begins to drip out of there. Um, they do make mold sealer. You can use little pieces of clay and, or uh, silk. Uh, silly putty works okay that you can sort of use to plug up the holes once your wicks run through. You'd want to use a wicking needle to sort of send down through to poke out the, uh, the bottom side of that mold. Uh, and you can actually thread them through. You know, you can use one big long piece of wick and sort of go down one, pull it out the bottom, thread it back up through the next one, and then over to the, the third one back down so you can sort of go you know, up and down through them all using one continuous wick uh, that way. They work well. Um, they make nice candles. You do end up with sort of that seam uh, because it's rolled uh, metal, and you do end up with the seam running down the, uh, the side, but, you know, that, that adds a bit of, to the charm, I think. 
Uh, would it hurt to leave the candle uh, in the mold until your shirt's set up? Um, you, you, you can leave it in there for a while. I wouldn't leave it in there sort of indefinitely um, because uh, it may begin to react a little bit uh, um, with the metal uh, and begin to discolor that wax. So you, once it's hardened off, you know, 24 hours, I'd pop it out um, so that uh, it doesn't begin to interact, interact with the, um, the metal. Um, what's the best way to color wax if you want different colors? If you're using this natural beeswax, it, uh, you can use coloring in it, but it gets difficult uh, because, um, because, of course, you're working with uh, a colored product to begin with. So you're going to have to add a lot of different, a lot of colorant to it. And they do make candle colorants. We've got it in our catalog. Um, and you may also want to consider, um, again, sort of working with the natural color beeswax uh, rather than trying to force it into a color that you're just never going to get a good, clear, uh, uh, true color because you're already working with sort of this orangey yellow material, um, if that makes sense. Um, you, let's see. Uh, so the uh, the scented oils again. I've already talked a little bit about scented oils. We. Um, there are essential oils and there are fragrance oils. Fragrance oils are synthetically made. Essential oils are distilled from uh, plants or, or, well, mostly plants. Uh, so something like rose or um, spearmint from mints and things like that. Um, you want to be careful that you don't add them when your wax is too hot because the heat actually evaporates off the, uh, the, the fragrance, um, the odors. And so uh, you'll be driving off the, the, the scent that you're trying to uh, impose on that candle. But you can certainly do it. And, and you can make some very, very nice uh, smelling candles. Um, uh, how do you make candles uh, in the picture that seems like a smooth taper? Um, uh, yeah, these, these candles, um, there are several different types of mold. These are actually hand-dipped candles. They're, um, that uh, that um, have been made and um, and then a machine used to sort of chop off the uh, the base. That's why these are so smooth. But you can get um, uh, molds and, and that uh, form this type of candle. And we we do have them we do have them in our catalog. There there's a standard uh, taper that looks very very similar to this, and it's a silicone mold, so there's no seam. It's not like that antique uh, tin mold that has a seam because it's rolled metal. The silicone mold is a solid tube, and so you don't end up with a seam, and you can produce a candle very, very similar to this. Um, what's the average selling price on uh, uh, tapers, votives, or tea lights? Um, it depends. On, it's, it's what the market will bear. Um, we have a, a friend up in Massachusetts that's selling some rolled candles, and I think she's going to uh, mark them at about $8 a pair. Um, we sell here, out of our catalog, some hand-dipped candles, and they're about 4 or so dollars uh, a pair, but we're trying to sell them so that people can retail them later. Um, we've got uh, in town uh, Votives, uh, uh, a store that's selling some Votives, not ours, but some other people's. And they're about two dollars a piece. Uh, tea lights, a uh, dollar a piece. But a lot depends on what the market will bear. If you're in a, sort of a nice gift shop, certainly a little bit more. If you're selling it at a farmer's market, maybe not so much. Um, uh, let's uh, let's see here. Um, so what keeps the, uh, the, um, the rolled candles together? I did fail to mention that. Let me back up to, uh, to that. Um, there's, whoops, go back up here to uh, the rolled candles. That's yeah, probably easier if I just jump out of it here and go up um, to the, uh, the rolled candle. This picture right here. Um, this, you can see in this, in this uh, slide the seam right here. What you want to do is, of course this is wax, so once it, you know, it, it, you can sort of shape it. So it's not like it's going to sort of spring open on you. 
but you do want to sort of take your fingers and just gently, gently sort of press this seam uh, down a bit. You don't want to force it so that you put fingerprints along there. Notice you don't see like a little thumb depression from where she sort of pressed the seam down, but you do want to sort of stick it down to the layer underneath if possible. Uh, and that, that holds it uh, together. Um, let's see. Uh, um, is there a ballpark ratio of wick size to uh, taper size? If you're doing tapers, either a, a 2 slash O or a 1 slash O, probably a 2 slash O would be better. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, does, does beeswax take color chips well? You can add color, but again, you're working with that sort of yellowish tint. Um, uh, would it be the same size wick if it's a 6 inch taper or a 10 inch taper? Uh, yes, it would, uh, just because the diameter of the candle uh, is essentially the same size. Um, uh, will I do a dipped candle class? I'm not, I'm not sure, Nikki. We'll see. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I did not talk about dipped candles. That's sort of a more advanced thing. Um, uh, uh, let's see. So, yeah, this, uh, here's actually a, a very good point. Um, should uh, light and burn for at least an hour rather than uh, light blow out, light uh, blow out? Um, I, I think that's what Wayne's trying to say. Yeah, that's a good point. That, um, what happens is that if, if you uh, light a candle and then blow it out immediately, it doesn't get enough, uh, it doesn't give it enough time to sort of create a little pool of liquid wax to get soaked up into that wick. And so what happens is if you light it, blow it out, you actually burn the wick, uh, and, and that will affect uh, the quality of burn as well. And I should also mention um, that uh, in, these, in these slides here, um, as, uh, let's see here, if I move down a bit to these, um, there, there's a good one. I oh, jump up. These, these wicks should probably be trimmed up a little bit to about a quarter of an inch. They're a little long, especially these wicks for the, um, for the, uh, the votives. Uh, that's, a, that's a bit long and probably should be cut right about there. Um, it's just a standard three-inch sized wick, uh, and so there's always a little surplus, which is nice because it gives you a little bit of a handle, uh, sort of like in this picture here, to sort of pull it, to pull it up from the mold. So you should trim your wicks as, as well. Um, where can you get the wax remover? We have it uh, on our website and in our catalog. Are there any natural dyes to color beeswax? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, I'm sure you could probably find some at a craft store. You just want to make sure that you don't use liquid dyes, again, because you could be, uh, you'd be introducing uh, that liquid into your wax. You'd want to use a powder. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, would you do a, a, a single pour for the long tapered candles in the antique mold? I would not. I'd probably do a double pour because what will happen is it will form that, that really deep depression uh, at the top, and so you'll want to sort of top it off. Do you bleach the beeswax to make it lighter? You, oh, how do you bleach the beeswax to make it lighter? You can use uh, hydrogen peroxide. That will bleach it out. A little bit of bleach will bleach it out. You can use, uh, I've heard lemon juice works. Um, any of those, you can, you can put uh, thin pieces of it out in the sun and let the sun do it. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I've heard a solar melter will lighten it up. Yes, that's true. Um, <laughs> Richard, uh, when's the next webinar scheduled and what's the subject? I usually schedule these uh, a couple of days before I send out the, the e-fire. But um, I'll tell you, I've, I've, I've been dreaming of uh, perhaps a mead. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my wife and son are away. Uh, they're at, the, at, my, at, the, at his grandparents right now. And so I'm, I'm bacheloring it, uh, if you will. And so I've been, you know, making these pictures and slides and stuff as I've been drinking my mead, thinking I ought to do a mead webinar. Um, I have dreams of doing it live, too, but that's too risky, I think. Um, uh, uh, let's see. If you pour uh, uh, wax into a mason jar, what type of uh, what type and size wick would you use? I would use the sixty ply wick um, for that. Um, 
that's a nice big one. In the mason jar, uh, you should be able to get away with one wick in there, but you've, you're going to have to make your own wick there, Samuel, uh, to get that uh, to get that down to the bottom. Um, so uh, just be aware of that, which I'm sure you already are. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, let's. Someone just uh, just finished. A, a, I assume a mead, and and here's one saying that mead would be great. It would be great, especially right about now. Um, that's, uh, that's all we've got for this evening. Um, I've gone uh, uh, just over an hour. Hopefully my recording worked. Like I said, I did get that message uh, at the very beginning, but I'm hopeful. Um, folks, uh, with the holiday season approaching, I want to wish you all a very happy holiday. And uh, enjoy yourselves. And uh, thanks for coming. And hopefully we'll see you at a, uh, a future webinar. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Bye-bye.